Good morning, everyone. Could I extend a very warm welcome to you all? And could also extend a very warm welcome to any visitors who may be with us this morning. We do hope they will enjoy themselves. Uh, I've got a few intimations to make this morning, so I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, first, to say that our pizza this morning, the gentleman sitting centre stage here, is Ace Duncan. Ian is a. See, you've made a mistake out of here. Ian Douglas, Ian is a former parish assistant at the Cross Hill Parish Church in Mull. He tells me he's been retired of a hazard of some kind, but he's all keeps coming back. Ian comes from Australia. So, Ian, I look forward to you taking our service this morning. I'm also a face to recognise in the congregation this morning. I'll get his name right this way. This is uh, the Reverend Duncan McPherson. That's the young gentleman sitting away on the front door here. <laughs> Duncan is our new interim moderator. He's been appointed by the Presbytery and he'll be coming and going back and forward to various meetings, etc., and helping us while Kevin's away. So, Ian and uh, Duncan, Duncan will be rolling with you this morning. I'm going to some of Well, on the subject of ministers, I spoke to Kevin last week. He's still on holiday and he, he, he sounds a lot more better, he's sort of back his old self again. It's amazing the number of people that have been inquiring about him. Xander is a presidential elder, she goes to various presidential meetings, and she's uh, a punch to the number of people that keep on asking for him in various churches or throughout the whole presidency. So we always send him uh, our best wishes, and I'm going to be able to send him from the church as well, from everyone in the congregation. So I'll say it on all your behalf. But he, he is guys who are making progress. So, Hopefully I'm not doing too long before we get them back in place again. A, a couple of people in and out of hospital. Tommy Taylor's out of hospital and making recovery. And John Downey's in hospital. So we wish them both all the best and, and, and a speedy recovery to both of them. Uh, after the service this morning, we have our state annual meeting. So as many of the congregations possible can stay behind. It's a fairly short meeting. We appreciate it's Mother's Day and a lot of people get Lunch is booked and all the bits and pieces, so it's your sure own a fairly short meeting, and uh, Duncan will be taking that meeting for us, he'll be sharing that for us. So it's just to present that account to the congregation, and that's it. Um, I'll let, I've got a card here from Bella and Samuel. Uh, they did a, a fundraising event in conjunction with their grandfather, and they raised £180 for the Sunday School of Young Church Fund. So well done. Um, and, uh, Lastly, is a, a sadness I'm going to announce for the death of Linda Robb's father. Linda Robb's dad, Jim, passed away yesterday. Uh, of course, and prayers for both Linda and the family, and they will let you know the future arrangements in due course. So, Ian, it's over to you to take the details of worship. Thank you very much for your attention.
doesn't seem like three years, 21 of March 2020, a date that will go down in the history books, our first day of complete lockdown. Remember these days? Thankfully, we have moved on all the memories, and for many, the sadness of that time will remain for years to come. Words like lockdown and social distancing and hand sanitizing and furlough became the everyday norm. Remember the discussions about vaccines? They were years and years away. One in four people turned to prayer or religion because they felt they had nowhere else to go. People had hope. And in this troubled world, in this, in many ways, a troubled world, we continue to have hope. So we come together this morning, and let's be thankful. Let's give thanks to God for that hope. Let's come together in worship. Let's still ourselves in the presence of God. Later in the service, we hear words from the book of Jeremiah, and as we still ourselves in preparation for worship, hear these familiar words from Jeremiah chapter 29. The response is printed in the order of service on the screens of the congregation. I alone know the plans I have for you, plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster, plans to bring about the future you hope for. Then you will call to me, you will come and pray to me, and I will answer you. Our old again this morning is from hymn number 192. All my hope on God is found in all my trust, He will bring you. <coughs>
follow challenge or let's come together in prayer a prayer of approach Father God we come here this morning knowing that you will not let us fall for we know that you walk with us in our lives knowing that our praise for you comes from the depths of our hearts we praise you for coming to us in Christ walking our earth sharing in our humanity through Christ himself we praise you for the inspiration you give to each and every one of us the knowledge that he experienced temptation just as we do yet refused to compromise staying true to his chosen path despite the awful cost we come here this morning to praise you for the revealing of your purpose in Jesus for all that we see of you throughout the earthly ministry of Christ we remember how he taught the multitudes instructed his disciples how he held those in power accountable as he interpreted their binding laws, showing them the errors of their ways, telling them of your one commandment, one law, to love one another as you love us. Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of all. In you we see changing seasons. You provide us with nourishment. We see your majesty in the mountains and the oceans. You are our defender, and we acknowledge the wonder of your love. Loving God, forgive us when we yield to temptation, when we crumble and take the easy option instead of standing firm by our principles, when we deviate off the path and take the easy road instead of staying on the road of right and justice. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we oppose instead of accepting. But we recognize that you will carry us when the going gets tough. We come at the season of Lent to recall your goodness, to acknowledge your grace and mercy, to commit ourselves to your service. Lord, hear these our prayers. And hear us as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us all to say. Our Father, shout in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I did put an extra hymn in, and I said to Alan, I can take it if you want. Alan says to me, You love singing. So we're going to sing hymn number 509. Jesus calls us for the tumult of life's wild, restless sea.
Well, it's nice to see the youngsters here. It's nice to see you all here. What a special about today? Mother's Day. Did you make your mummy <coughs> breakfast in bed? Uh, did anybody get their breakfast in bed? No. No. None. <laughs> anybody? Anybody go out for lunch? Uh, it's Mother's Day and mothers are all very, very special. You can see from the orders that I've got, I was there. Now tell me, was anybody there yesterday at Murrayfield? <laughs> oh, was anybody watching the television? Yes. Was anybody really excited at the end? Yes. Blood pressure rising? Yes. Like now, I'm going to do something I don't often do. I'm going to turn my back on you. There's a very special reason for that. Jesus healing 
the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda, which is just about to say Sheep's Gate, now it's Lion's Gate. And you can see the go to this. And it talked about, I wish we had the Bible with us, and we looked at the passage, and it talks about the five porticles, the five arches. You can see some of the arches there. And you can't actually describe the feeling when you actually stand in the same place that Jesus stood and healed. I was there. For the next slide, Peggy. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, some of these olive trees are 2,000 years old. They're, they're, they're carbon dated. So these are the very trees that when Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he would have looked at. So I'm not fascinated that we stood there. So there's a big sign saying peace at the, at the side of that garden. And the next slide, Peggy, is actually from the Mount of Olives. You go through the Garden of Gethsemane, you walk up to the Mount of Olives, you look over to the, the the, uh, the dome, and you look at the old city of Jerusalem. And we spent a lot of time doing, we were in all of the many sites. The next one actually was, was, was a very, was, was very emotional because we went to Nazareth, where Christ was born. Jesus was born in Nazareth. And actually, got a, 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 a museum there run by some Christians. And they've got carpenters and potters and they've got weavers and they've got the, the, the way it was 2,000 years ago, including a, 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 a where they the ground the grapes down and made wine and dated that to 2,300 years ago. So it's probably there when Christ was growing up as a boy. So that's nice. The really interesting thing there was because there was quite a bit of trouble when we were out in Jerusalem when we were there. There was quite a lot of tension. But we went for a meal after that. There was a meal in the Christian centre. Uh, a chap said, I'm a Muslim. He said, I work for a Christian organisation here and have many friends who are Jewish. And we all live peacefully together. We all live peacefully together. And yet down the road in Jerusalem and Janine and Jericho, and there were some terrible things happening over there. Next slide, Peggy. For me, this was probably the most emotional part of the trip, the Sea of Galilee. And actually, I was quite glad we kept that hymn in when Andrew was called by the Sea of Galilee, because where we were was where Jesus called the fishermen. And to stand there and look at exactly what Jesus looked at, when he called his fishermen, I can't even describe that. I can't even describe it. I was there. And the next thing is the last one. It's just again the Sea of Galilee looking out. And you can see, because that day it was a strange day, it was very, very calm, and the wind started up and the waves came in just as Jesus was out and the, and the storm came in. Yeah, just started the storm. You can actually see how the Sea of Galilee had been very, very strong. You know something? While it's great to be there and be there when we look back in memories as a child or the Hogs Work Express being on that train or being there in Jerusalem or up in the Sea of Galilee, but we have to be there because in the Bible we have people who were there who recorded the Gospels, all the stories, because they were there. They were eyewitnesses to all the things that Christ was doing. And maybe at the start of the Gospels, we should have a big sign up saying, I was there. Because these stories that we read in the Gospels and, and Paul's letters are there because they were recorded by the people who were witnesses to everything that was going on in that ministry of Christ. Through that short three years of ministry over 2,000 years ago. And we should remember that when we open the Bible. In fact, do that. When you open the Bible and you read a passage, just remember these words. I was there, because the person that wrote it was there. Now before we have our, our time with the youngsters to go out to, uh, to Sunday school, I've been looking at all these Easter eggs and thinking, I won't start today, will I? <laughs> and I was told, well, they're not for you. Uh, so I'm going to ask Fraser, because Fraser is going to come up and just tell us about what's been going on and to, to acknowledge the fact that everybody's been gathering these and where they're going to go. So Fraser, would you like to come up and say a few words? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Fraser McGowan. I'm the business leader for Joseph Watts Funeral Directors just down the road. Um, I came here on today to first of all say thanks to every single one of you and everybody that's been able to donate. It's absolutely outstanding and people's generosity really don't know any bounds. Um, it's great. <coughs> and Andy needs to take a few that we carry out to all of our branches in the area and we try to see how many we can get in and then we pick all the care homes, local charities, the hospices, and nursing homes um, that we can take them to. 
It really is it's a, it's a small thing over time, but it does create a really good impact and quite a positive feel, not just for everybody involved in donating, but the people that receive the donations. Um, so thank you, I really appreciate it. Uh, we are still collecting and gathering, it's uh, usually a little bit of a mad rush because it builds up to Easter. So after we've chased everybody up, we'll let you know in due course just about the amount that we've got and how many that we've handed out to each and every place. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for letting me come along today, I really, really appreciate it. And again, thank you so much for all these things. I promise uh, the man there won't be getting any. <laughs> 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 I hope you still do anything, so I'm still trying to go that way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Fraser. Well, I like your work you are know, doing in the ANA. Thanks, everybody, for supporting them. So, before the children go out, we're going to sing a beautiful hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, number 547. What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Because 
they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forget their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. Now the second reading is from John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33, and again from the New International Version. Subtitled, Jesus Predicts His Day. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. <coughs> he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Mighty God, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Now that we have read your word, help us to live in your ways, your truth, and your life, as you continually reveal yourself to us. Amen. Thank you, Elspeth, for reading the Word of God to us this morning. So we, before we reflect on these two passages, let's sing a beautiful hymn. It's the number 522. The church is wherever God's people are praising, knowing they are wanted and loved by their Lord. <laughs>
God hears our call and comes to us in times of trouble. Jeremiah, well, he was a troubled man. He was both a priest and a prophet, and his message was one of complete change in God's people because they had moved away from God. His ministry began way before the time of Christ in 627 BC and spanned 40 years, a whole working lifetime. Jeremiah was successor to the great prophets of a century before Isaiah, Isaiah, Amos, and Micah. They preached in the days when there were still two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And a hundred years later, there was one kingdom, Judah. And Jeremiah's ministry coincided with the last years of the kingdom of Judah. He was one of the prophets of the exile, along with Ezekiel. God's people had started to drift away from God. The leaders within Judah were failing to give true leadership and teaching. And at first, Jeremiah was calling for the people to repent their sins so that they could be restored with God. And it didn't make any difference. They failed to do that. He prophesied that God would punish Judah, punishment which would lead to restoration. But all of this was very hard for Jeremiah to, to take because he was a faithful man. He suffered a lot because of his message. He had to forgo the normal social and family life. He was a victim of imprisonments and beatings. Inwardly, he was hurting because of the fate of it. He knew that people would have to endure because they wouldn't turn back to God. And so he was a troubled man. He complained frequently, sometimes bitterly to God, and God responded. We have that wonderful verse from our call to worship. I alone know the plans I have for you, plans to bring about prosperity and not disaster to bring about the future you hope for. Then you will call to me, you will come to me and pray, and I will answer you. And that leads us into today's reading, that new covenant, that new covenant with both the people of Israel and the people of Judah, where God promises to forgive their past ways, to forgive their sins, to make them his people, health in the nation restored, the new covenant would not be like the old one which previous generations had broken. This new covenant was written on people's hearts, not on stones like the Ten Commandments. The new covenant will be an everlasting covenant built on forgiveness. And Jeremiah's persistence, his unrelenting focus, was totally vindicated. God bringing all his people back together. In the words of the prophets generations, generations earlier, fulfilled by the word of God <coughs> and years later 600 years later the birth, the life the death <coughs> and the resurrection of Christ himself in the New Testament we see God's new covenant in the life of Christ Jesus and that takes us into today's gospel reading this was after Jesus entered into Jerusalem where the reality of all his teachings and his death start to unfold to the people who are following him and the disciples around about him. William Barclay describes this passage as the seeking Greeks, and only John's Gospel records this incident of the Greeks questioning, where can we find Jesus? Which makes sense, as John's Gospel was written to present the truth of Christianity in a way the Greeks could appreciate and understand. They were a learned people, they were a questioning people, where people were always trying to absorb information. They were trying to appreciate and understand. They were the travelers of the time. It wasn't unusual to see them in Jerusalem at the time of Passover, even though they were not Jewish converts. They would have heard about Jesus. They would have wanted to find out far more about Jesus. He performed miracles. They had this inbuilt desire to find out about things. They went to Philip, which would be quite natural because Philip is a Greek name. We want to see Jesus, he said. Philip went to Andrew. Andrew went straight to Jesus. No one could ever be a nuisance to Jesus, particularly if someone was seeking to know about him and his teachings. And who could not be excused for feeling confused and hearing the next statement that Jesus made when Andrew and Philip went to him? The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour was Jesus approaching passion. The grain of wheat, a clear illustration of what that was about to happen. That death is essential for further life. 
Look at all the seedlings that are going to be sprouting up over the next couple of months. They would have been like dead seeds in a garden centre in a packet in your house. You sow them in a greenhouse and in May they burst into colour. New life. That dead grain of seed becoming new life. The daffodils just commenting, driving in the street when the daffodils are not going out yet because we're that much, much higher. But driving into Bell's Hill today along the right side of the road. Once I went through the diversion, it took me all over the place. There were these fields almost of daffodils, all being bulbs in the ground and the frost and the snow and the ice bursting into new life. Death of Christ would produce life for many. The contrast between loving and hating is in that passage as well. The consequence of following Christ and the consequence of rejecting Christ. And then Jesus himself shows his humanity, the fact he was a human being. Now my heart is troubled. What shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me? But that is why I came, so that I might go through this hour of suffering. And God spoke, as he had done at Jesus' baptism, at the transfiguration, and now as he approached the hour, God again spoke to the crowd after Jesus spoke the words, Father, bring glory to your name. Some heard the words from God, I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. Some heard the words, others had their ears and their eyes, their eyes closed. They only heard thunder. The religious leaders had closed their ears to the very teachings and prophecies of the great prophets. Jesus was a threat to them and their comfortable existence. And he had to go. So their eyes and ears were closed to all that was going on. They did not hear the word of God. People expected a leader to come and free them from the tyranny of the Romans. A leader who would be a king, not a leader who rode on the back of a donkey to die a humiliating death on a cross between two common thieves. But that was the path that Jesus had to follow. John Drain, in his study of the New Testament, comments on this passage in a number of ways. Jesus realized that the time for his death had come. And so he set himself to go to Jerusalem to fulfill God's will. This is what Jesus told his disciples in the record of events so accurately recorded in Luke's Gospel. He said that everything that is written of the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished and fulfilled. In all of his three short years of ministry, Jesus had been irritating the authorities from day one. As John Ray puts it, the Gospels clearly tell us that this is all part of God's plan. Irritating the leaders, making an enemy of the people in power. And Jesus knew exactly what was about to happen. And that leads me on to the final part of this reflection. What do these words mean to us in today's world? What are the challenges of these readings in today's world? I'm saying to stand that I'm chaplain to the 498 squadron of the air training cadets over in Hull. And I go along with padres that are every so often. And I, I quite often go in during this Lent period, it was there on Wednesday, and we talk about Lent. And actually for young people, they always amaze me because they are from a, a, a variety of faiths. And yet, they will ask very probing questions, and particularly about the resurrection and about this period of Lent. And they'll ask about faith, when did I become a Christian? Is there a light bulb moment? And you know, we've had some wonderful discussions with these young people who actually support the churches and model that I was assisting that very, very well. I lost a bit of, of attendance with the, with the uh, pandemic. But now we're starting to go and look along in Easter service at the day of Remembrance Day. We help out the coffee mornings. And they asked one question. When Jesus was on the cross, why did God, God not intervene? He could have intervened. There's a whole sermon on why God did not intervene. But we have some really interesting discussions. And I do a talk with them all about the resurrection, the lead up to the resurrection, and all the factual aspects of the resurrection, because they find it very difficult to accept the resurrection, some of them. And yet when you sit down and explain it to them, and you look at the facts that are recorded back to what I said before, about I was there, all these eyewitness accounts, many of them come up to me and said afterwards, you know, you've really made me think. 
That's God calling to us. And I love our hymns today. We're all about calling and following and opening up that door of welcome to the Christian faith. So what's our challenge from today? One of the things about lockdown, and we still see it to a certain extent, that I found was quite hard was when we all had to wear a mask. You couldn't see people's faces. You couldn't see whether they were smiling, whether they were downcast. You could only look at their eyes, and you can actually see a lot from people's eyes. And I got to, to, to look at people's eyes a lot, and quite often I would see people who are really, really troubled just by looking at their eyes. Behind the mask, you could see their eyes. God sees past the mask, and we, in many ways, wear a mask, don't we? He looks into our eyes, he sees into our soul, he sees into our heart, he looks into our mind. He can see the troubles that very often we mask, that we keep to ourselves. God looks beyond the mask. Jeremiah was troubled, Jesus was troubled. God understands our troubled emotions. He sees beyond the mask. And out there in this world today, I know there are a lot of worried and troubled people. But Jesus tells us as we, we read earlier, Come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying a heavy load, and I will give you rest. For the yoke I will give you is easy, and the load I will put on you is light. That's a challenge for this week. Lift the phone to someone you haven't talked to for a while. Stop and chat to someone and simply ask them, How are you? How are you? I can guarantee that some of you will get the response, Thank you for calling. You could not have called at a better time, I was feeling so low, and your phone call is so welcome. Or that chat with somebody standing at the bus stop. It's amazing how people just open up to you when you ask who they are. We have a food bank over in Motherwell, and uh, remember during the lockdown, uh, we still had people coming into the food bank, we were allowed to run the food bank, and I remember being over there one sunny day, I think it was the spring, and people were coming in and out picking up their food. The, the food bank, and I went outside to get a bit of fresh air because I was in the vestry waiting to meet somebody. And there was this dog sitting on the doorstep, just with his lead on. This event was a staffing, and I thought, what a well behaved dog just sitting there opposite the owner on the side of the food bank. And I thought, oh, I'll just sit down beside the dog. Now, it was a friendly dog, and they go, I thought, one of two things are going to happen. It's either going to eat my hand or it's going to lick my hand. But I might lick it by the point of view of trying to eat it, just get a taste. <laughs> So I sat down beside the staffy, and it was a lovely, friendly dog. And the owner came out, and the owner came out, and we started to chat. Could I have a comment with the dog? He said, this is my friend, he said. This is my life, is this dog. It's a lovely dog. And we started talking. And he, had, he actually had a good job, and his life had just gone off the rails. Off the rails. And as he walked away, he stopped, he turned, he turned around to me and said, thank you for talking to me. Nobody talks to me. They avoid me rather than talk. They cross the street. Thank you for talking to me. You don't know what that means to me. Go out this week, lift the phone, have a chat. God leads us to those people who are troubled, those who are lonely, those who are hurting. And as his disciples, we can bring God's comfort and his blessing by simply saying, as I said, there are many hiding behind a mask in today's world, so many searching for that hope we all long for, so many reaching out for something to cling on to. John chapter 14, there are very familiar words. Let not your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your hearts be troubled, for God hears our call and comes to us in times of trouble. Amen. The hymn 112, God, whose almighty word, chaos and darkness hell.
as we bless these other offerings, may they be used to further your word and your work in this land and further afield. Loving God, we give thanks that you are the life of giving Lord. We give thanks that Jesus comes to us every minute of every day. We give thanks that we can turn to his words of teachings and we can turn to him in times of trouble. We thank him for this season of Lent, this time which invites us to pause and to take stock, to reflect on the things which really matter in our lives. We look at the changing seasons, the first signs of spring, of new life after a long winter, and we give thanks for the new life we see your hand at work. We thank you for this time and place set apart week by week, these special moments when we focus on you and remind ourselves of your living presence. On this Mother's Day, we give thanks for mothers all over the world. We give thanks for the love and care only a mother can show. We think of those who long for motherhood, for whom this day is a hard day. May you bring them hope. We give for those for whom motherhood was never fulfilled. May you bring them comfort. We pray for those whose relationship with their mothers is broken. May they be healed. Loving and caring God, we pray that words of peace may come to those who are struggling in so many different ways. Those who are troubled with everyday life, burdened with anxiety, those who are ill or awaiting results of tests, bring them comfort. Take the load they carry and ease their burden. Bring words of peace to those who grieve at the loss of a loved one. We pray for our leaders in this world, which is in so many ways a world of war and conflict, mistrust and unfairness, inequality. We think especially of the people of that land in Ukraine. Leader, may our leaders make decisions which are not based on vanity or destruction, but based on the principles so clearly laid out by Christ himself. Heavenly Father, draw us closer to you so that we may set out into the world around us with renewed hope, with vision, with strength, and in faith. And finally, Lord, in the silence, we bring to you those we care for and are worried about, that they too may be touched by your Holy Spirit.
Your calling to us reveals the glory of the new dawn. Our faith in you brings us hope, brings us comfort, brings us peace in ways which go beyond our human understanding. And now the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all those you love and care for, wherever they are in this world, or whether they are in the next world, now and forevermore.